Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the new sporting director of FC Akron in Russia, Chris Doherty. Chris, welcome to the show. Yeah, Connor, pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Chris, I know we've spoke now for a long time off camera, but just to give everyone listening a brief rundown, how are you getting on in Samara at the moment? Yeah, no, very well. I've not been here too long. And just as I mentioned, I haven't really done too much outside of work, to be honest. So I, I can't really comment too much on the general life. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's been a whirlwind. There's just been so many things to do that um, you don't really have a lot of time to reflect on at the moment. I think it's probably one where maybe six months from now, a lot of the processes will be in place. You, probably you'll start to see the team play in the kind of way you've envisioned. And you've got all your key staff and players in place. And then and then maybe it becomes more of a job of management and you can you can kind of take it all in, you know, what's going on. But at the moment, it's, it's one of those where every half an hour there's a new challenge or a new situation comes up and you're always kind of reacting. So um, so I'm just enjoying it and I'm just immersing myself in it at the moment. I'm sure it's no problem for somebody like yourself that, I mean, your whole your life today, all 29, 30 years have been infatuated with the game of football. But Chris, I mean, where did it all begin, this love for the game? I mean, could you, I suppose, walk us through your earliest football memory? Um, oh, I mean, my earliest football memory would probably be like three or four years old. It's one of those, if you were to go to my dad's house even now, um, he's, he's long been retired and all you would see, he's got, you know, one of those, I probably shouldn't say this on the podcast, but he's got one of those boxes, you know, where you get the games from all over the world and uh, all he does is watch wall-to-wall football. Um, and I remember growing up actually that my mum distinctly hated it because all he would do was watch football and then when I became obsessed with football as well you know she saw that and she doesn't like football so she was kind of angry at me that I was so big into football as well um, but but it's kind of if you actually know my dad then you see I just grew up watching football all the time you know going to the stadiums from four or five years old as well experiencing the atmosphere um, and obviously playing, you know, it was back in an era where you still played with your friends in the neighbourhood. You played at school every break time, every lunchtime, probably the last uh, generation to do that. And and um, on mass in Glasgow. And yeah, I mean, I, I also remember just everything collecting the kind of my Christmas presents. You know, we didn't have a lot of money when I was young, but but like the football annuals, like I think it was Match was the name of the magazine. You would get the annuals. You'd read about all the players. I used to, I used to kind of know all the players who played in all the big clubs in Europe and. It was just, it was just my hobby, and um, even even when I started to get like the kind of games consoles, like the the PlayStation or or whatever, it was only really football games I played. You know, obviously there was Pro Ev, there was FIFA, um, and I was never really into anything much else. So it's probably it's probably quite sad in a way that I, I don't really know a lot more about other parts of the world or life outside of football. But but football also teaches you a lot because it's given me the chance to travel to experience cultures, to meet different people. And I think there's a lot in it as well, social dynamics and the psychological elements of, of how people interact with each other that you can pick up from working in the game. So uh, almost um, a lot of things I know about life and the world in general have come through football and I, I wouldn't really dream of anything else. I think it's funny you mention that because it's a common theme of most guests that come on this podcast, Chris, they speak about the semantics of football such as yourself. And they say like, Football educated them, gave them an education. They got to see the world's lens through the game of football. And it's fascinating when you're actually able to articulate that passion and give it back to others, which you've obviously done throughout your career to date. But where and how did you manage to develop this coaching book, I suppose, when you're growing up in Scotland? Uh, well, I remember I was probably getting to the point like 15 or so at school and I was at one of those schools in Glasgow where most of my group of friends or almost all of them were going to leave school at the age of 16, which obviously you can do in the UK, as you know. Um, and mo most people don't really stay on and study and go to university in general and, and the group of friends that I had at that time. So it was a real crossroads moment where I had to decide what do I want to do with my life. And I remember that, I mean, I really enjoyed PE at school. And at that moment, I was actually thinking, well, could I be a PE teacher? And, um, and it was also one of those things where even the theory side, the, you know, learning about PE and how the body works and how, I don't, like one of the modules was structures and strategies, for example, and football was a, was a sport on that for, for standard grade PE, which we now understand as, you know, like the tactical side of the game. But, but all those things were kind of happening at that time. 
And, and because I was interested in the PE teaching route, my, my PE teacher had a really good relationship. She was, she was really a mentor figure for me. And she said me as soon as I turned 16 to do my early coaching qualifications, because she knew it would help me to, you know, start taking young teams of people and start working with them in sport. And, and I started to do that. I started to work with the, like the primary school team that I used to play for, which was across the road from my house. I started to work with like the first year school team um, at the, the high school I was attending as well while I was in fifth year at the school. So, so basically from the age of 16, you know, just on a, on a local voluntary level, I started to get involved in coaching. And by all accounts, looking back, I had no idea really what I was doing and, um, and it certainly wasn't doing things well, but it was something that became immediately apparent how enjoyable it was. T to be honest, um, probably the most enjoyable years were at that beginning stage where you're working voluntary, you're working with the local teams. Um, it's not quite as cutthroat as, as obviously in a professional game, even academies, you know, it, it's a lot more cutthroat than, than in the, the community teams and the boys clubs. Obviously, first team level is a whole nother animal, but it was one of those situations where I loved it. It became a life, you know, uh, my whole days, even when I was at university when I was coaching, I would, uh, you know, I, I wasn't focused on the studies. I was just focused on thinking about what training would be like with the team and, you know, how we were going to play at the weekend. And I, it was just one of those moments where I realized if I could get paid full time, and I wasn't even thinking at that moment about, working at the top level or getting paid a lot of money, you know, those things were not even in my, in my mind. It was a case of, if I could get paid a full-time salary to do this, then I need to give this everything I've got. I don't want to do anything else. There's nothing I could do that I would enjoy more than doing this. And um, that was, that was really the start of it. Terrific insight because you see most people now that qualify with these masters in sports management and MBA at football industries or all these courses, Chris, their first, I suppose, lens or their first focus is to obtain work, you know, immediately in football, where reality is probably in reverse. I mean, you underwent a significant apprenticeship time where you gave yourself the ability to make mistakes, the ability to learn. And the ability to know what was right, what was wrong, and what you could implement going forward. I mean, do you think you could have achieved the success you've achieved today, which you have, without that apprenticeship? Well, first of all, I th thanks for the kind words. I mean, I'm not sure I've achieved any any success so far. But what I can say is that probably, for example, the job I'm in right now, I wouldn't have gotten to if it wasn't for various circumstances, which I can elaborate uh, briefly. But the first thing I would say would be about the academic side, just to touch on what you mentioned there. I mean, I never really got a whole lot out of my, my undergraduate degree, you know, um, to be honest with you, in terms of helping me in my career. I mean, I never really probably wasn't, I wasn't focused on it enough. And that was my uh, fault at the time. Um, but in general, I would say that after a couple of years, after I finished that, had more experience that by that point, also working with elite players and elite youth players, um, then went back and done a master's degree in performance coaching and then by that point, I was really armed with the, the, the day to day working knowledge of working with, with high level players and reflecting on everything and uh, all, all the processes that really meant when, when I was looking at research papers, for example, in the masters, I could apply it really to what the real life experiences I had were. And it gave me a whole other lens because the master's degree was transformational for me, I would say. Um, uh, the first thing it forced me to do was to organize my thoughts. So I probably already had a lot of ideas, thoughts, processes about how I worked, but I had to then to, you know, submit these essays and assignments. I had to be able to organize it on paper and then articulate it to somebody else. And that was, that was the first thing that was important. The second thing was a lot of the assignments were very reflective about how you work in your environment. So in that course, for example, uh, you had to already be working in a, I think, a, an elite or a, or a kind of somewhat professional coaching environment to enroll on the course. So every, they made sure that all the assignments were something you were able to tailor to your own working environment, which therefore meant that you were, for all the different modules, whether it was psychology, whether it was physiology, or whether it was more um, specific coaching practice, everything, everything you would do would be reflective of your own work, including you know, filming yourself doing sessions and then you know, the notational analysis of how often you give this type of feedback or that, or reflecting on, um, you know, maybe like the physical development programs you have in place, 
how that applies with, uh, in relation to the research that you've read, et cetera. And then, and then obviously you're, you're, you're going through all the research papers and you're, you're trying to apply um, the research to the reality. And sometimes you look at things and say, why am I doing this? You know, am I doing this because of a habit or because of an instinct? But actually there's research saying that maybe there's another way to do it. And, and on other times you're looking at research and you're saying, this actually does not apply, at least to my environment. It may apply in another coaching environment. And as we'll talk about later, and as you know, in all different cultures, the right and wrong way to coach can look completely different um, depending on what the expectations there are. So, so it gave me a lens through which to evaluate all the scientific research as well into the field. And I think that's something at the undergraduate degree, you don't probably have as much of that lens. And therefore, there's a danger either one that you, you don't really absorb the information fully because it's, it's not practic uh, practically applicable or that you just take everything for granted that you read and then you have the opposite problem where um, you assume all of this is correct and it's maybe not actually the best way to work in reality. Um, and the second thing to say about the, the experiences where having not been a professional player and, and ha having found it difficult at first to break into the game, I had to do a lot of different part-time roles just to make up a salary. So, you know, at one stage I was, I was coaching, you know, with the young players, I was coaching with the older kind of teenage players. Um, at the same time, I was an analyst, uh, an opposition scout for a first team. I was a sports scientist. Um, you know, so over like a couple of year period, I was doing all of these different roles. I was a scout as well. Um, so I was doing all of these different roles in the game. So now if we talk about uh, the sport director role and probably a big reason why I've, I've had this kind of opportunity at a young age is because really my role is to is to link and align and you know and paper manage although I, I probably don't like that term as much uh, I would prefer to say link and align all of those different departments so having had having had to work in all of them I actually know what what they have to look like uh, you know in a, in a professional environment which is a huge advantage because um, if you haven't done the job of that person it's, it's obviously harder to relate and understand um, their process and what they're going through so the the real difficult situation i had to break into the game in the beginning has probably turned out to be an advantage later on but to get to that point there's a lot of patience involved because there's probably a lot of moments along that road where you're not making a lot of money, you're working crazy hours, you don't see friends, family. I'm sure, Connor, you know exactly what I'm describing here. And there's probably a lot of moments where you think, <laughs> if I was working this hard in another career, I could probably be earning very good money and, uh, you know, it, or, or have a better work-life balance. And a lot of people who were further ahead of me in the beginning, who maybe had been at top academies or had a lot of connections in the game, um, I think I think a lot of them gave up because of that. You know, there's there's a patience that it takes a lot of time, and you just have you almost the head coach I worked with at Dundee United. He used the term blind faith because he came from a, a background as well where he was coaching, you know, in the semi-professional leagues, and he's now the head coach of Dundee United, and it, and it also didn't seem possible for him. But I think his description is very accurate. It's almost a blind faith where for for a reason which is actually not um, really logical. You somehow believe that if you just invest all of this work and all of these years of your life, eventually you'll get where you want to go. Um, and there's absolutely no guarantee that will happen. Yet, if you don't have that blind faith, it won't happen. So it's a kind of chicken and egg situation. And that, that, that was at least been my experience in my journey. Really, really fascinating. And it's something I touched upon with James Gow as we spoke off camera at the Academy Director at Al Jazeera in this week's podcast. You know. Do you necessarily need to have goals in mind? Obviously, they frame the challenge and whatnot. Or are you just driven by your love for the game? Because I find an awful lot of people that are in roles such as yourself are just curious because we see the game as an infinite game. You don't see you don't see it as finite, do you? You see it as beyond the pitch, beyond 90 minutes. Well, 100%. I also do sometimes see the situation where maybe the younger coaches trying to break in who were in a similar position to me maybe um, in my early 20s, they are quite something specific about what they want to do. They want to work at this level, at this academy, or they only want to be a coach. They don't want to do the analysis or the sports science or the academic path. And I think the more strings to the bow that you have, first of all, the easier it is. That, that, that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing is 100%, I, I just wanted to work at the game at the highest level that I could. That was my original motivation. 
for sure, coaching was the thing I loved the most out of everything and probably still is the most fun thing. Just the yesterday, I was at, I went to the academy here and when you see when you see the young kids, you know, especially the little ones like 11, 12, and they're dribbling and the what you know, the 1v1 skills, it's it's such a pure enjoyment and love of the game that uh, I, I really buzz off it in a way that in a way that it's hard for me to, to, to describe. But um, but then you also have to be practical and, and realistic. And the, let, let, let me let me let me say this as well. The other thing, let's let's take the Jose Mourinho example. So how did Jose Mourinho get his chance to be a coach? Well, he started as a translator. You know, he was an academy coach um, before, but would he have ever got a first team opportunity as somebody without a background in the game if he never became a translator to the head coach? Probably, he, we might never have heard of him if that opportunity ever came up. But if he said, no, I don't want to be a translator, I'm a coach, then he never meets Bobby Robson. You know, he never gets himself in those networks. He never gets the, the chance to show those people what he can do. You know, Robson would never ask him to scout the opponent. He would never then see the quality of his knowledge or depth of his knowledge. And he would never then get him involved as part of the coaching staff. I probably had similar experiences um, on the analysis side, um, which is a lot of uh, also long hours in that role and sometimes not a lot of thanks for it. But through that, that got me the opportunity to work very quickly with the national youth teams, for example, in Scotland. And then you're mixing with a lot of good coaches. Um, you're exposed to a lot of ideas. And then once you're in the networks, then if, I think if you're good and you're driven, people recognize that. And of course, people want others on their team and on their side who, who are like that. So that's something else that I would say to people is if, if they were in my shoes then, I'd say the first thing is try and put yourself in the right networks and the right circles. And, you know, you can't get yourself there by if you only want to be the head coach, for example, then you're going to have to start at the lowest possible level. But I think if you're willing to work in whatever position in the game is required, it will get you uh, in more doors more often. And I think the best way to be in the right place at the right time is to be in more places at more times than everybody else. I think it's a brilliant contextual frame what you just spoke about, Chris, kind of that intersection between passion and reality. And obviously you went away, you got your bachelor's, your master's, your theory underpinning the practice. But for all the un, for all the armchair philosophizing in the world, you went away and you sought to put that theory into practice. And I don't think you could have picked a better challenge than to move from the East End of Glasgow to China. Take us through that. Well, I think it's quite similar to the Russian experience. You know, sometimes when you make these decisions, um, there's often a lot of people who are um, skeptical. Um, I don't know if you experienced that, for example, going to Dubai or, or the US, the West Coast US, because it's probably different. You know, Dubai is seen as like a high quality life. Obviously, California is, is a paradise. I know I've been there myself. So maybe that's a little bit different. But certainly with China and with, with Russia, um, there is this kind of skepticism. And um, even being here now, I see how there, there's almost a fear sometimes for people to move to these countries even if there's a, a much better opportunity for them to develop and grow. And I suppose I don't really understand it, which is why it's so easy for me to make these decisions. Um, but but I, I do realize that for some people, it's not that, not that straightforward. But for example, the China opportunity, I mean, for me, it was just about making a career in the game. That was what I wanted to do, as I described at the beginning. Then again, you assess the reality. So where are you at that point in time? Okay, so in Scotland, I was in probably... To be honest, I was in a good situation for, for my early 20s. I was working with the Scottish Football Association. Um, most of my work was was day-to-day -day working in the elite performance school. So you're working with the best young players from the different academies in the country by day, Monday to Friday. Then every so often, I would go away with one of the national youth teams and and uh, be involved there, which, again, you're getting exposed to, to quite a high level at a young age. So I'm certainly not complaining about that. That was That was an unbelievable experience. At the same time, I also recognise that in a, in a country like Scotland, which by all accounts is still quite old fashioned in many ways, getting better compared to maybe 10 years ago, but still still um, not very modern thinking in many departments. Then a guy in his early 20s who's not been a player, etc. I, I, I didn't really know what much more I could do in Scotland than where I was. And after a few years working in those programmes, working every day in, in that performance school, for example, I felt like I was now ready and invested so much time and energy to the learning and development process that um, I felt ready to go and implement my ideas somewhere. And I wasn't going to get that opportunity there. That, that was probably the first cut and dry thing. 
The second thing is obviously Scotland is, as you know, the weather's not that great there. It, it, it's, you know, it's not somewhere I was desperate to stay anyway. So, um, and I think also when you grow up in a small country, you probably also have more of a mind to, um, I don't know, I don't know, maybe the, the, you understand the world's bigger than just your country. So at the same time, obviously a lot of people in these small countries, they, they all they spend their whole life there and they stick to what they know. But in general, for me, um, it was always a case of, uh, I was never particularly concerned about staying in Scotland. Actually, I was quite excited about the chance to move abroad and experience new cultures. So that was the other thing. So, so at that point, the opportunity came up in China. And what was exciting about that was, um, the, at that moment in time, there was big um, push from the, the president to President Xi to develop football in China. There was obviously a huge investment going on in the country. Um, and there was a real, a real seismic opportunity to, to do something in a country of that scale. Obviously, there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of reasons why China is not already a major player in football. I probably obviously didn't know all of those challenges before I went out, but I still wouldn't change that for the world because, because it, was, it was one of the best experiences of my life. And what you get when you go to these countries where the culture is so, so different. Now, part of the time in the beginning, I was in Shanghai, which to be honest, is very westernized. But then I did move and, and I spent six months um, outside of Shanghai in places where uh, essentially nobody speaks English. And, and um, as we would call it, real China, you know, and there the culture is very different. Obviously, the language is different. Um, I didn't go there with a family, with a wife, with kids. So, you know, you don't really have a social circle outside of perhaps the people you work with because, because of the language barrier. So that's quite isolating. So you're dealing with, you're dealing with all of these things. You know, sometimes um, buying something from the store that you really need, it becomes a challenge. You know, in the UK, you can just jump on Amazon. You can get it done. Over there, you're, you're both stretched professionally because you're going into another role where you have to develop skills that you haven't already had. At the same time, your day-to-day -day life is much more difficult. And I think, I think um, obviously, sometimes that can feel a little bit stressful and overwhelming. But, you know, when you look back, for example, after six months of an experience in China, it's probably like two or three years of staying, at, staying in Scotland in terms of the growth that you experienced there. And um, all, also what China gave me, which is what I was searching for at that time, was a chance to be more on the implementation of ideas. So in Scotland, you know, I could certainly work with players on the pitch in my, in my previous role. But, um, for example, at the association, if I wanted to change something in terms of the curriculums, etc., uh, I have to say there was not a lot of opportunity for me as a young guy to really influence those things. And China had that opportunity to put in new ideas. And that was what was very attractive for me. And, um, and, and as a result also of that role, that was the first exposure I had to managing staff, for example, to managing other coaches, many of whom were older than me, you know, had uh, higher level qualifications, pro license, whatever. Um, so... So you also have to find ways to get their respect. You certainly don't get it for granted. So you have to try and um, develop a management style. You have to be very certain about your knowledge and how you present information because it will be questioned. So there's so many things that I developed in China, particularly on the management of staff, particularly on processes. I also had the opportunity in China to work, for example, with um, an individual called Dr. He, who won't be known in the West, but He's a, he's a very successful executive in China. Um, he was the CFO of the Wanda Group, which, which grew to be one of the biggest companies in China uh, and in the world. And he's also now, a, he basically is a consultant who works with top executives in China on management. And I'm sure he charges handsomely for that. And I had the opportunity to work with him for free on a daily basis. Um, and, and he would help me on how to manage uh, strategically and also um, on a human level with the staff. And to get a kind of apprenticeship as well, I mean, it's hard to really put that into words, how valuable that is. It's something that maybe, you know, to people who are insular on the West, they might, they might say, well, China's not a top level of football, but, you know, I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as ready for this role, put it this way, as I am today, if I hadn't had that experience. They're all formidable experience, especially when you surround the contextual frame around it, Chris. You see a lot of people that make such a move, and it's all about surviving, and it's about getting through this challenge unscathed. But when you can do that, plus do more in terms of implementing your ideas, in terms of gaining that apprenticeship, as opposed to taking an extra responsibility and meeting people, 
such as the CFO, the ex CFO of the Wanda Group, it puts you in such a good frame for the future. And undoubtedly, the grit and some of the skills you've had to show, the soft skills such as motivation, habit of ferocity, is something which you take into your current role today. But um, obviously, we spoke off camera briefly, and one of your brief sojourns was with Hadjuk Split in Croatia, a club which is renowned in Europe for its famous academy. But in Hadjuk Split, I seen you on your LinkedIn page, Chris. You had quite a multifaceted role there, right? You were involved. You were the assistant first team coach. You were also working closely with the technical director, and you're also working with the um, academy, if I'm not right. I mean, did such a role prepare you for, I suppose, the current position you're in now? Well, well, basically about the role at Hajduk, I think I think it's probably a little bit in reverse. It was probably the same reason I'm in this role now. As I mentioned, all those early experiences I had in different roles, that was that probably led me to get um, a range of experiences when I went to Croatia. Um, a lot of that was down to the sporting director. So I had a long-term relationship with him. We worked together on various projects as well. He actually came to China when I was working there, presented coach education because he he authored the Croatian Football Federation's youth curriculum. Uh, he used to used to run Dinamo Zagreb's academy, which at that time and and I think still, you know, to be fair, is one of the best in Europe. But certainly at that time, it was it was a really really high level, um, and. So basically, we, we had a long-term relationship, and I think he trusted me on various factors, and he knew I had a broad skill set. And um, originally, what happened was I, I was working in China. I came back. Um, I mean, it's a funny story, but also obviously not funny at the same time. I came back for Chinese New Year um, around last January for, for a kind of two-week break before returning. And during the time I came back, the borders closed because a virus had started to spread in China, which obviously... You know, we all know, we all know now what, what, what I'm talking about at that moment. You know, obviously I assumed that things would quickly get back to normal. But then I was then I was stuck at home for an extended period than I had anticipated. Um, at the time, I think it was Igor Tudor was the coach in Hajduk. He, he then left to go to Juventus as assistant coach. But I also met him. I, I went to Hajduk during that Chinese New Year to, to see Ivan, the sporting director, who I mentioned, see how they were training there. At that time, I went to a few clubs, you know, around Europe. Um, during the break, because I would always try and keep in touch with, with the new ideas. So, so anyway, so I met I met the coach. Um, I saw everything environment. They didn't have a they didn't have someone to scout the opponent at that moment. And Ivan, the sporting director, contacted me and said, "Would you want to do this on Y Scout? You know, remotely." Um, they couldn't send anyone anyway because the the virus was kicking in and it wasn't live scouting. So he said, "Obviously, you you're at home with, with probably nothing much to do right now, and we need someone to do it." Um, and and uh, I think I think I started to, to send in those reports remotely about what I thought about the opponent, suggest some ideas, and um, obviously I'd met uh, Igor Tudor, the coach, when I went over briefly, and I think I think everything was kind of discussed internally there to then bring me over in person, because at this point we are now approaching the summer and the border still haven't hadn't opened in China, so it became clear that there was no certainty about how things were going to were going to return to normal over there. So, so then I went to, so I went to Hajduk having done this, basically being an opposition scout. Um, and that was how I was working with the first team. And then once I got there, you know, there was various things changed along the way, which opened up different avenues. Um, as a little bit of a unstable club and volatile club, um, I think in, in that, my period there, um, I probably worked with, I think, five maybe head coaches and not too long a period, I think. I think now, there's maybe been like six or seven or maybe seven different head coaches in the last 18 months, something like that in Hajduk uh, at the first team level. So that's just a crazy figure. Um, and that kind of gives you an insight into the challenges that you have there. But at the same time, a massive club with massive expectation. So as part of that, you know, um, when things change and, and different staff come in and out, you get exposed to a lot of new ideas. Um, and that also opens up opportunities. So, um, at first, I went in to work work uh, with the first team, um, continue to look at the opponent, but get more involved also in our game model and tactical ideas, start to suggest more, then start to suggest things uh, for the training process, etc. Uh, what happened was basically as soon as I moved there, Igor Tudor left, he went to Juventus. Um, another coach took over. Um, he, he wasn't so keen, uh, mainly because I think I was also close with the sporting director and sometimes there's a lot of, of paranoia sometimes. Um, about that, so he didn't want to talk too much to me necessarily about a lot of his ideas. So, 
Um, at that point, then I became, I started to work more closely with the sport director on different aspects of what he was involved in. And I got to learn that role, which was something I didn't go over there to intend to do, but has now led to the role I'm in now. So that was again, almost by chance. Um, and then that coach changed again. Uh, the academy director, Boro Primorac, who used to work with Arsene Wenger as assistant coach at Arsenal, he became the head coach interim. And then I started to work again, more, more involved with, with the first team situation there. Um, but then the, the sporting director resigned and then obviously they needed someone to, to also communicate with other clubs um, uh, for, for the January transfer window. So, of course, I spoke English, um, arguable for, for a Scottish guy, but I spoke, um, I spoke English better than the other scouts, let, let me put it like that. And I'd obviously been working with the previous sporting director on a lot of the plans. So then I began to be the person who would speak to the other clubs about interest in our players, interest in their players, etc., um, so it was one of those kind of really weird experiences in many ways it was absolutely everything you wouldn't want for, from a journey in a club where the head coach is always changing the president changed while we were there which led to the sporting director leaving uh, the vice president also who was a really good guy who was influential in bringing me in left Mario Stanich he used to play in the English Premier League yeah. Chelsea for example so, so there, there was a lot of things happened which were really unstable and, and um, I would have rather didn't happen, but that instability led to me basically being someone who was moved around almost from pillar to post in some ways. Um, but I became involved in almost every aspect of the club during, during my tenure there. So that, again, has been something which has helped prepare me um, for this role. And it's funny, it's not, not something I necessarily think about, but when we're talking in this conversation now, probably a lot of the, the challenges and the on-paper bad things that have happened in terms of struggles to get jobs or you go to a job and things don't work out as you expect but as you mentioned about being flexible because you just want to be in the game and you're willing to do different things that has that actually creates its own opportunities and uh, that's probably the pattern that we're seeing here it's a remarkable insight into actually what goes on behind the closed doors of a football club yet what i'm most fascinated by chris is your time at hadrick split is the concept of youth development. You know, despite what we're led to believe, in spite of all that organizational volatility and the infrastructural and resource constraints those guys suffer in Croatia. I mean, how do they emerge year on, year out, year in, year out, producing players for the first team? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we could talk about this for hours in itself. Um, <clears throat> okay, let, let me let me just start about Croatian football a little bit, and then I'll return to Hajduk specifically. So. My, my kind of um, fascination with Croatian youth football started maybe around eight years ago when I was working for the Scottish FA. Um, at that point, I went to Dinamo Zagreb to visit the academy. Ivan, who was the sporting director who brought me to Hajduk later, at that moment, he was running the academy in Dinamo. So that was the first time I met him. I also returned two years later again for another week. But at that moment in time, particularly Dinamo Academy, the, the level of talent which was there was unbelievable. And I went with my, my boss from the Scottish FA at the time. And I, I remember one of the days we went back to... I, I, one of the things we found was, was, for example, a lot of the training ideas. Um, we, we were people who were obviously trying to always learn from the top coaches and always pushing things. So a lot of, a lot of the training sessions we saw in ideas, we learned a lot of good things, but a lot of the things we were already doing as well, you know? So obviously you could look at that and say, well, that's a good thing, but... I remember we went back to, to the hotel one night and it was like two or three in the morning and, and we were just sitting there and saying, what, what are we supposed to do? You know, like the talent levels that we have in Scotland are just not of the same density of quality. Certainly you get individuals who have the same quality, like a Billy Gilmore, for example, now is a famous example um, at, at Chelsea. Um, but in Croatia and in the, like Dinamo Academy, you see... 14 or 15 potential Billy Gilmore's in every age group, you know, not one per, per country, you know, every few years. So it was one of those where we're saying, well, okay, we're already doing a lot of the, a lot of the things that we see, but, but we're, you know, how, what else do we need to do? We can't just copy what they're doing because they're already ahead of us. And the problem was that even at seven or eight years old, when we, when you watch the under eights, who by the way, already trained four nights per week, with the coaches over there, and not just uh, street football four nights, structured, um, organized training four nights per week. Plus, they still play on the street over there a lot. Um, 
then you see those seven-year-old kids before they've really had any coaching and they're already phenomenal. You know, the coordination, the balance, the, the 1v1 skills. There, there's, something, there's something quite special over there. And, and it's different to maybe what you would see just in general from the young Scottish kids. So the first thing that led me to explore was uh, the, there is probably a genetic factor as well. Because and, and when I then went to Hajduk, at, for, at that moment in time, when I first saw Dinamo, I thought, well, Dinamo takes all the best young players in Croatia. Like, for example, some of the teams had almost all the national youth team players at the one squad. So, of course, the standard was unbelievable, but you're assuming, well, this is just Dinamo. Then you go to Hajduk, and you also see the same phenomenal level of talent in the academy there. And then you, then you go to some local villages in Croatia, and you watch your football, and you see the same thing. And then you start to realize that it's all over the country. And then you also start to hear a little bit more about the Balkan region and you see that, you know, Serbia and Bosnia and Macedonia and all of these countries have talent, you know, to, to a higher or lesser degree. And there's reasons maybe why Croatia developed theirs better. We can talk about that in a minute, about the methodology. But just in general, on the talent, that region, and it's not only about football. They have the talent for basketball, water polo, tennis, um, handball, you know, they are very good at all of the ball sports in which they participate. And for such a small country, I, I can't think of any other country in the world which is so good at all the sports in which they participate. So th there, was a, there was a research paper that showed a genetic link where athletes who are good at, who are at the top level of ball sports um, tend to have a frequent, frequently found this um, genetic code and we don't really understand it enough to say this gene makes you do this better. But we analyze the people who are successful and we say, well, the people who are successful at this, a lot of them have this gene. And then we also find that in the Balkan region of Europe, um, that gene is found more frequently than in other parts. So um, there does seem actually to already be with a very limited understanding that science has of genetics at the moment and its application to sport. There, there is probably something there where they, they adapt very well to, to the ball sports, their coordination with the ball, et cetera. And then there is still, then, then there's a culture for sport in general. Uh, Croatia has the highest number of, of sunny days on average in Europe per year. That means, of course, there's a culture where kids play outside more often um, because the weather's better. Then I can give you some examples. Let's talk about in Zagreb, the school system is oversubscribed. Uh, a feature of the political and um, perhaps a government instability and organization. I, I, don't, I don't know what you, want to, what you want to call it, but if this was in the UK, we would say this is a big problem. The school system's oversubscribed. Well, what does it mean? It means that they have to split the school day in two. So half of the kids in Zagreb go to school in the mornings, half go in the afternoon. So that then means that the kids go to school a little bit less and then they have more free time. So there's more free time then to play outdoors. The other thing it means is that the coach at the academy, for example, Dinamo Zagreb, doesn't get 16 or 18 players every day, so they can't work on their team tactics to beat the opponent at the weekend. They get eight or nine players in the morning and eight or nine players in the afternoon. So by de facto, I'm sure it's part of the philosophy they would want anyway, but they have no choice but to focus a lot on the individual technical development of the players and the small group tactical decision maker, um, 2v1s, 2v2s, 3v2s, and they really, zo and it's not just that they play 3v2s or 1v1s or they do passing drills like many coaches do, they really focus on the details, they stop it a lot, they correct it a lot, and they make sure that everything has been done um, with the correct execution in mind. So there's so many things about the culture there in general, combined with this perhaps some genetic factors, which lead already to a large reason why Croatia's so good at football. Then their the culture is also very social. They like to get together with other people. So team sports is an obvious advantage. Football is, is, the, is the national game there. They're, they're very passionate about the game. So everybody loves football. Everybody watches and plays football. So again, you, ha you have a large percentage of the population playing the game. Um, and then you also have the methodology at the academies. And probably one difference you would find, for example, from a Bosnia, which is next door to Croatia, is I, I would say on the whole, not being disrespectful because I'm sure there's probably some very good academies in Bosnia, but on the whole, academies like Dinamo, for example, and Hajduk, maybe are a lot more structured um, in terms of what they do. And also a lot more structured than you would find in most Western academies. 
And I think what I've found in Eastern Europe is that um, maybe on the whole, there's more disorganization than sometimes you would find um, in the West. But, the, but for example, the, the academies in football, where they are structured, they are much more structured than they are in the West because the tradition in Eastern Europe for all sports where they've ever been successful is that you have a very structured curriculum. It's a very analytical approach. They drill with repetition, all the techniques that they want and all the, all the coaching points that they want, the coach is the teacher. It's not a straight to the game approach where you step back and let the players figure it out. So, so you, you take these Croatian people who um, by culture are very creative and spontaneous, not very organized, I would say by, by nature, very um, able to solve problems on the fly. And then you put them in this very structured training system, which takes that individual creativity and teaches them how to be part of a very structured game, which is the modern football game, and playing one and two touches, et cetera. And then you have, so you have these, these great combination of factors. Then the other factor, which is the key thing as well, is that once you take all of this talent that you have in academies, well, the other choke point that you find in a lot of countries is the transition to first team. Well, you don't have that problem in Croatia because there's no money in the game. Attendances are very low on the whole. Um, TV revenue is, is, is very low. And the clubs survive financially by selling players from the academy. So at Hajduk, we had no choice. We were in a deficit. Um, I won't say the exact figure, you know, to, out of respect to the club, but, but we were on quite a significant deficit every year that we had to make up. And I'm talking, you know, a, a, a significant number of millions, you know, that we had to make up by trying to develop players that we could sell. So otherwise, you, you make a loss for the year. Uh, Dinamo's got a slightly different situation, but they, they have, a, have an owner which um, basically wants to make a profit from, from the players that they sell. So the clubs are very much geared that you have to then put these young players, once they're 16, 17, 18, into the first team, you make them project players and you develop them to sell. So you have all of the, these combination of factors and they have B teams as well. So that so the players who are even not ready for your first team at 16, 17 are playing in the second league, um, which is which obviously is still quite a good standard. In the Croatian second league, every team will try and build up from the back and play, you know, a, a, a style of football which would be conducive to elite development. Um, so so there's so there's so many factors really which come into play, which then lead to a 4.5 million country getting to the to the and population getting to the World Cup final. It, it's not one thing. It's many things and all of those things together. Uh, and in Hajduk, um, it was the same situation which had been probably caused by mismanagement from 10, 15 years previous to our arrival, which meant that the club had a poor financial situation, which meant that we had no choice but to establish a system where the young players have to be promoted to the first team. And as a sporting director, you have to create a pathway where you don't block the path for these young players to come up. So all, all, all of those things are, are factors. Um, and, and absolutely, Hajduk has got a very good academy, as does Dinamo Zagreb, and as does a couple of the other um, Croatian academies. And I'm sure that we'll continue to see young talents um, coming through those systems. Absolutely fantastic and extensive insight you've just delivered there, Chris. Both practical and it's obviously stuff which you've researched and observed a close lens. But if I was to really push you now as a sporting director, of course, and a big part of your job, of course, is aligning the academy to the first team, you're looking at the highest determining factor in evaluating youth development, right? And if I had to push you, be it culture, genetics, methodology, or the infrastructure, resources, and people, what for you is the key or the most important there? Well, well, it's definitely not what, what I thought it was when I, when I was a youth coach in the beginning. I used to think it was all about the, the coaching, you know, or, or at least a large percentage of it was about the coaching, the methodology. Um, I would say the methodology, the people, the infrastructure, the resources are, are absolutely not the main factors. Absolutely, they, they have a big impact. You can certainly improve a player significantly with the right methodology, with the right coaches, with the right people. But on the whole, uh, the culture of the country in general, whether players, which, which I saw in China, which was they don't have. And um, if you have a culture of all the players playing the game from the youngest ages, and I'm talking about before coaching, I'm talking about two, three, four, five years old, early exposure to the football. And um, Tom Byers, an individual who, who speaks extensively on this, who people can look up if they, if they want to um, 
uh, if they want to know more because he knows much more about those age groups than I do. But in general, I agree with his, his philosophy on that. And scientific research also shows that the sensitive phases for developing, for example, kicking a ball, it comes between the age of maybe five and six, for example, which is before you would start working in an academy. Um, and, then, and then the culture just in general of the, the people, um, and, and I don't mean people of the people in your academy, your staff, I mean the, the players themselves. The, the players are the key factor. When I, was a, when I was a youth coach, I used to blame myself when a player with potential didn't make it uh, to, be a, to be a top player. And I took it personally. And I've since realized that, that it was completely wrong, you know, because some other players who you coach exactly the same way do become professional players and other ones don't. And as I say, you then go around the world and you see that um, a lot of other, you know, successful academies work in similar ways to how you were working. But ultimately, it's up to the players, you know. And, and that's another thing about, for example, in Croatia, another factor which I didn't mention. So again, you see how many factors are at play. The economic situation is also um, not always as good as it would be in some of the Western countries. Uh, unemployment in Zagreb, for example, is quite high. I think it was, the, I remember one of the years I went to visit, it was around 35%, which I think is, is, is extremely high for, you know, a major European city. Um, and you have a situation, for example, where I remember one, one of the talented players at Dynamo Academy at that time, the parents were, with, were trying to withdraw the kid from school and homeschool him, which is basically code for make him practice football all day because football is still seen as the way out, just as in South America, for financial and economic change. So they still have that culture, which I think we've lost in the UK. I think um, there's not the same, this is, this is the life-defining um, opportunity to make it as by being a professional football player. So they do still have that to a larger extent there. Um, and, then, and then the other factor is, for example, let, let's say Dynamo, if you were to watch a training session where, I don't know, I've seen sessions with under 16, under 17 players who are already technically very, very good because that's what the talent ID over there, which again is another factor, which is very different perhaps from a lot of, maybe, maybe a lot of English academies now are in the European direction. But South Europe in general, compared to the UK or North Europe, the ID different things. They, they're not looking for the athletic players. They're looking for the players. Athleticism to them would be more about agility, balance, coordination, how fluid does a player move. But it's all about technique. It's all about decision making. It's all about intelligence. Um, so, you're take, so you're looking at, let's say, 15-year-olds who are already technically very, very um, on a high level, you know, for what you would see perhaps in an English academy. And then they might drill them with some basic technical unopposed work for 30 minutes at the beginning of training. And I mean, repeating the same move over and over and over again. And you don't see one kid um, looking at the sky, bored, you know, when he's waiting in line for the next shot. You don't see one kid approaching the coach and asking him, when are we going to play a match? You know, this is boring. Can we play a game yet? Which you, which you would have perhaps in a UK academy, certainly in Scotland, you know, if you're doing that kind of work repetitively. So... You also have this culture where they, and I think, again, this is what they're used to in Eastern Europe and the same in China, you know, in, East, in the East in general, in sports and also in education in China, the same thing. For example, mathematics, just repetition of the concepts. Um, so they accept that way of working much more. And also, there's, there's such a depth of talent. For example, if you are the kid in Dynamo, unless you're a real top, top player um, and you're not focused on that kind of work, they'll just get somebody else because there's so many other good players around in Croatia uh, and they can, they can select the best ones. So there's no option for you not to have that level of discipline. And that's a level of discipline that I don't really see uh, in Scotland, I have to say, in general. You do see it from some kids in, a, in every age group in the good academies. But, uh, but en masse as a country, to do that type of dry, repetitive, unopposed work. And like I say, not only are you doing drills, the coach is stopping, correcting, and the players are focusing on correcting the details of the work. I think that's the key differentiator. It's not about whether you do opposed, unopposed, or, or um, it's about are you repeating the right things or the wrong things? You repeat the wrong things, you get a bad habit in the subconscious part of the brain. You repeat the right things, it becomes a good habit in the subconscious part of the brain. So the players are focused on improving the, the details of the execution. And... I, I can assure you, you know, there's a lot of players, for example, in, in North Europe or in the UK who would much rather run laps around and do physical work 
than focus on the details of the angle of the pass, of the weight of the pass, because it's harder, you know, because they haven't been working on it from the youngest ages. So, um, so you also have this fantastic discipline in the culture. Um, I, I, and I think those things are fundamental as well. You know, and then you have that best v best environment as well by, by nature, that there's a lot of density of talent. You know, in China, you can certainly find a very good player. And, and just as you would have found in San Francisco, you would have found a very good player, I'm sure. At, at some point, you would have found one player who you said he could have played in a Chelsea academy or a national academy. But how many of them were around? Did he train with 14 other players of his level every day at his academy? Did he, did he play against every other team of a similar level at the weekend? So all of these factors come into play and, and none of them are actually about the coaching and methodology, which obviously I believe is absolutely you know, something that we should invest a lot of time and energy into. It's just something that as coaches, we want to believe that we are the most important thing sometimes because why would we invest so much of our life into perfecting this craft if we didn't believe it was very important? You know, it's very hard for our ego to absorb that. But the reality is that you can give two different players the exact same process and information. Some of them will take it on board and, and make it. Some of them will take it on board with a top attitude and still not make it because maybe they have an injury or they have genetic factors which limit their potential. And some other kid maybe who, who doesn't behave as well and um, doesn't abide by the laws of growth mindset. Maybe he's just extremely quick and has a genetic advantage and he does make it. You know, all of these factors that I've learned from experience that life isn't always fair. There's, there's sometimes a degree of luck and randomness. You know, it does, does the first team player at his, eight, at his club get injured when he's 17 and the coach puts him in? And if the player never gets injured, he would never have been in the team. I mean, so many factors which are, which are involved. And the game is the greatest teacher of them all. And I suppose, like, if you didn't know what the roles and responsibilities of a coach was before, I think, Chris, you've highlighted that there in the last 10 minutes. But could we say the same now for your current role as a sporting director? I mean, there's been a lot of confusion over the past few years over the roles and responsibilities and even the name. I mean, are you a sporting director? Are you a director of football, a technical director? Yeah, I mean, my, my title here is sporting director, but I think the roles, the names can be used interchangeably, certainly. So uh, uh, it's essentially the same role. Um, I actually have, I actually have um, created a course, um, a university course, uh, which uh, I'm a lecturer on about the sporting director role. And that was very complex to do because, as you said, at, at 10 different clubs, the role can be different in each of those clubs. And, you know, the, the profile of the, of the sporting director can be the completely opposite. Um, for example, some, some sporting directors have been agents in the past. They know a lot about um, negotiation. They have got a lot of contacts and they work a lot on the market. Um, some sporting directors like myself, I mean, I, I've been from a youth background as well. So um, developing the academy would be something important for me. Um, obviously from a coaching background as well, um, the coaching process, the analysis, the sports science, all of these things, the processes are important for me. Um, not saying that they're not important, maybe from somebody who's from the other background, but just that the, our knowledge is, my, my knowledge about negotiation will not be as strong as theirs because they've had more experience in that. And maybe I've had more experience in other things. Now, this club decided to, that the profile of sporting director they wanted was um, the type more like myself. I'm 100% sure if they wanted somebody who was more experienced on the market and buying and selling players, there would have been thousands of options, you know, better than myself. So, so it's always about the club to define what they want from the sporting director, which again is difficult because who decides that? Is it the owner? Is it, is it the CEO? You know, do they really understand football? Do they understand football strategy? Um, do they know actually what makes a good sporting director? What this club did here at Akron, which I thought was very smart of them, they, they actually got some advice um, from a consultant who is, a, I, 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 can't, I can't say his, uh, his name publicly, but he's a very well-known and, and, and uh, well-regarded sporting director himself and an expert in the field. And um, he helped them to create the profile and conduct the interview process and then recommend to the CEO which person would be the best fit for the role. Otherwise, how would they ever have known exactly what they were looking for? So again, the club has to know what type of club they are. Um, if you're Brentford, you're going to look for a different sporting director, perhaps. Perhaps not, but perhaps if you're Real Madrid and you're looking for the best possible players 
and it's not about saving saving the money, perhaps then you know it might be a different it might be a different guy. So um, I do think the club has to define, and then you as a sporting director have to when you go in be sure that you also define what the club what the expectations are and what's under your remit. So in my role here, I, I probably have um, I probably have almost everything to do with the football department under my domain. Um, but I've heard various nuances that with different sporting directors where, I don't know, for what, maybe, maybe they have a head of performance and the sporting director is not involved in the sports science domain or maybe the academy director is completely in charge of that or maybe they have a powerful head of recruitment who's experienced and the sporting director is more on the, the academy and the development but they don't work so much on the recruitment or maybe the sporting director is all on the recruitment and maybe they come from a scouting background. So. There, there's there's various different ways that the role can look, um, and um, mine is what it is here. But it may it may be completely different, you know, uh, if I was to work at another club. I think we must caveat this by saying you're a 29 year old sporting director, Chris, which is absolutely amazing. What you may lack in age, you certainly make up for in experience. But what I'm very intrigued to learn about more is obviously it's very small sample size of time, less than a month. We spoke off camera. You've been in the role, but I mean. How can you effectively stress test some of the changes or the systems perhaps you've just put in place? I mean, would you be aligned to put more weight perhaps in the KPIs from a data point of view or perhaps some of the non-measurables such as the cultural changes around the place? Yeah, well, I mean, both, 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 both to a large extent. I think, um, you know, look, there's a lot of new things for me in this role. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, although, as I mentioned, I've worked in the various different departments. There are obviously some parts of the role that I probably have have strengths in that which um, which help me, but there's a lot of parts of the role where I've I've never been exposed to, for example, certain things to do with contracts and illegal situations are completely new. Even just the, the regulations in Russia about how you build a squad and, and what's required. There's there, there's many new things which you encounter on a daily basis, and then there's obviously a language barrier where you're relying on people to interpret information for you and and provide it. Um, which make it make it challenging. So I, I'm stretched absolutely every day, you know, and I'm learning new things every day. As as we spoke about with the China experience, that's the quickest way for me to grow and develop. So I'm I'm delighted it's the case. But I have no doubt about it, you know. Um I, I have just done 30 as well. So I appreciate the kind uh, being in my twenties is probably <laughs> is probably uh, I would rather be, but um but but in general to say I understand I am young for a sporting director. Um uh, but 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 certainly I'm somebody who's learning on the job, you know, very much. So so it's not like I have the answers about in terms of the process. We do want to have a data driven approach as well at the club. We think it's a competitive advantage. So part of my role is to create a strategy where um, I approve with the owner and the CEO um, a series of KPIs for all aspects of the club, and then we have to find ways to measure. You know, what is the what is the objectives of the club? Um, and that can be more than just getting promoted and winning the Russian Premier League, you know, in the future and playing in the Champions League. Or uh, th those are vague and very broad um, objectives which the owner does have. But but that but we c that's not going to help us to get there, you know. So if we break it down step by step, for example, um, can we can we compete with the biggest uh, clubs in Russia pound for pound? Absolutely not, because <laughs> you know you're 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 talking about um, in some cases uh, state-owned. Companies, for example, Gazprom, who owns Zenit St. Petersburg, uh, the owner of Sochi, for example, these, these people have invested huge sums of money. You know, Luke Oil at Spartak Moscow, um, which, for, you know, if you want to go down the route of um, we'll spend more than you, then, you know, there's, there's going to be a never ending cycle of they, they, them able to one up you on that. So we have to be smart. We have to do things in, in, a, in a, um, a way which means we count every penny that we spend. Um, it doesn't mean we won't spend uh, money when it's necessary, but it means that we have to be strategic. So, for example, if we want to be a club which lessens the, because we're a privately owned club, which is also rare in Russia, which means that our owner, one individual, funds everything at the club. So if we want to lessen the burden on him and have a bigger budget um, to compete uh, without relying on that individual, then that means we also have to find ways to generate revenue. Now, we're a new club founded in 2018, so it's not like Manchester United where you can rely on, you know, the 60 plus thousand fans coming to the stadium every week and you get TV money and you get, no, 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 we, we, we will have to develop players. 
sell players, you know, we'll have to be, we'll have to get more out of the players that we get for cheaper money in terms of the, the sports science, in terms of the analytics, in terms of the coaching processes, et cetera. Um, and th there's, you know, there's a whole host of things there, which, which we try and innovate with and try to put into play. But then we also have to, for example, if we define, this is one example, if we define that one of our goals is to um, sell one player per year to lessen the, the burden on, on the budget, um, on the owner. And let, let's say we also, the owner wants to create a legacy of youth football in the region. So we also want to develop young players from our academy who, who play in our first team or, or even go on to bigger clubs and play there. Then we have to break those things down. Okay, where are we now? Um, how long will it take realistically to get to those points? What are the steps along the way? And then how do we measure those steps? Sometimes the hardest thing is the measurement and the KPIs. And then, and then also you have to develop a, you know, a, a data analytic approach to how you can measure that sustained growth. I think if you can do that though, then it gives you a, a clear strategy. And um, it also as a sporting director, it buys you time from the owner. Because another thing that you, that, you know, when you have an ambitious owner who is investing all of his own money in the club, then certainly he, he wants results, you know, and um, although, although our owner has, has agreed um, very kindly to a strategic long-term approach, you know, nobody here is naive, you know, if, if we want to do things a certain way, then it's better that we go to him, we show the step-by-step -step process, we agree on, on the steps we need to take to get there, and then we go back to him and show where we're making the steps, but also when we fail, where we haven't made the steps, and then we explain why and what we have to do to get there. And I think for people who are not from a football background, um, I mean, well, I've had probably a couple of um, slightly amusing meetings with the owner where I've had videos of specific tactical situations and I'm trying to explain to him, you know, maybe some detailed things about the positional game and, and what we can improve in the team. And I think he enjoys it as well. And the CEO also, you know, to some extent. Um, obviously, I think, I think they understand uh, metrics. They're business people, you know, who are, who are successful and very intelligent. But, but they understand KPIs um, on a much stronger way, the way that you and I might understand the, the tactical um, view. So I, I probably see things from a more um, intangible point of view. I kind of like, I kind of know this player's not playing well, or I know that, you know, the, the team's not done well in the build-up because of this and this. But then I have to find ways that I can also communicate that up. And managing up is, is something which is very new. If you've never been a sporting director before, compared to perhaps being a coach or... Or, or a similar type of role to that. So, so that is certainly something that we're working on here. Well, I thank everybody having listened to this episode. Chris will certainly be keeping an eye out for FC Akron in the coming few years, but just, I suppose, a brief overview or a brief preview of, in fact, of what's to come. What is the short and medium term ambition at the club? Well, I think I think um, obviously promotion from from to to the Russian Premier League is, is the main one. You know, I, I'm very keen not to put a timeline on that because um, I think it's more about the process and working day by day. If, if our training sessions are good every day, if our if our recruitment is good, um, uh, if the analysis is good, if the if the sports science department are, are working well, the medical department, then the reward for all the hard work and the good process will be promotion. There's no doubt about that. Um, so there's no need to talk about perhaps dates and timelines, but uh, but obviously that is that is the first goal of the club, and then from there it will take time to establish in the Russian Premier League and then eventually push to be a to be a European level club. Um, but in general, you know that's the short term goal. We have to get out of this division. Um, in terms of how we do that, then if we work backwards, then then again it's about improving the processes of all of those different elements we spoke about. You know we've. We've um, just purchased an academy here, the Konoplev Academy, which is which is very famous in Russia. Um, it it's, has has certainly been regarded in the past as as maybe the best or one of the best academies in the country. It used to be funded by Roman Abramovich. Um, so currently in the Russian Premier League, I think there's around 26 players who are from our academy currently playing. Four who played at the World Cup for Russia, the last World Cup. Uh, two who played against Spain and under 21s uh, just a week or two ago who beat Spain under 21 level. So we, we're actually, we've actually inherited an established academy system. Um, I never had a parent club before, so it was a private academy. So that means that the best, uh, or not, not all of the best, but a lot of the talented um, 17, 18 year old players are already gone, you know, because the, the top clubs in Russia have already cherry picked them. But below that, there certainly is a lot of talent and a lot of good established processes. We have a boarding school there. 
for I think uh, over 120 kids that we can that we can house there from all around Russia and uh, and and globally if we if we like. Um, we have a school there, so we can teach the kids at the school and be on top of everything in terms of their education. And we have we have a, a legacy and a process of, of, of doing things um, at the academy. So so we've already inherited that. So there's no doubt we want to have the best academy in Russia. That that's that's one thing. And um, as part of that, we are. Um, Again, I can't maybe say specifically about the name, et cetera, right now while we finish all the, the paperwork, but we are very close to, you know, the individual flying over to, to Russia who has spent 11 years at Dinamo Zagreb, the aforementioned academy, um, uh, as a youth coach there. So, so we'll certainly employ a lot of the same ideas that I saw in Croatia, and uh, we'll put that kind of model in alongside what we already found here in terms of good practice. Um, then with the first team, um, we are we are going to we have a squad which is already built for a, a a game to control the game with the ball. You know it's important. When, I think when you develop the DNA of the club, there there was no point in me trying to um, follow a Red Bull approach when I would have to change twenty players. You know from the squad, which are built more for a a controlled game than an athletic game. And the academy, the Konoplev Academy, which we bought, used to work with the Dutch and Belgian coaches. So it was very much the Dutch methodology about, again, controlling the game with the ball. So it makes much more sense to go in that direction. So all the staff, the coaches that we hire, and the, even, for example, if we, if we change in the future a fitness coach or a, a, you know, a scout, it should be people who understand that methodology and way of working. Um, so, so we want to be very, very strong on the positional game in terms of our tactical approach. You know, I, I do believe the game at the modern level is very tactical. Um, I'm not a believer that, that it's um, any more all about the players going out and just doing their job. You know, I, I want players to know at every phase of the game uh, where they should be and what movements they should make at what time with what trigger. Uh, and and we'll, we'll put coaches in place who have that level of knowledge. Um, and then it's all about breaking things down further from there. You know, we'll also, so we'll also sign a number of young players for our squad we want to develop for the first team squad. Um, we have to work with them also individually. So we'll have coaches who are um, very experienced and, and, and perhaps some of the world's best youth academies who will work with, within our first team to develop those players and, and the methodology for that. And we'll also have specialist coaches, you know, who work with maybe units of the team who, who maybe used to play in that position. We're, we're also going to have a set play coach, for example, which is obviously an idea which has become popular with some, with some um, successful clubs, but certainly not all at the moment in, in the world and certainly in Russia. I don't think it's I don't think it's common at all. Um, so uh, it's all about and obviously we maybe you've seen that as well. Or you mentioned you were on LinkedIn. We we struck up a partnership with uh, Analytics FC. Um, maybe you heard of them uh, last season in the media because Kevin De Bruyne negotiated his contract using them at, at Man City. So 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 we've agreed a partnership with them. We'll, we'll we'll use data again, for example, for recruitment and other aspects of our approach. So it's all about trying to um, maximize every marginal gain that we can to have the best possible approach. And in the end, hopefully, we'll we'll play a a, a very structured and dominant um, positional game and attack, um, I, which is also for me a lot about the defensive game because when you develop players and you recruit players who who can play in tight spaces and one in two touches. It means, that, it means that when you attack in tighter spaces, when you lose the ball, you now have more players around the ball in a tighter space, and then you, and then you can immediately win the ball back easier. So, so it's also you know, very much linked to the defensive strategy. So that is the vision for what we see going forward, and um, it will take a little bit of time. But I, I'm pretty confident that even by next season, you know, the, the, we'll be able to see some progress in terms of a lot of those aspects we spoke about. I think it's no wonder, Chris, that you've actually gone on to produce your own <laughs> university course and a sporting director. I mean, I've done 50 plus episodes in this podcast and few others have given such a better synopsis over the past hour of actually the proper roles and responsibilities of a sporting director and what that role actually entails. I've been fully enlightened and I'd imagine, to be honest, anyone listening to this podcast fully will do as well. And there'll be plenty out there that'd be actually incredibly inspired and touched by your own journey growing up in Glasgow, going out into the world, China, Croatia, now Russia. But I suppose for anyone out there, Chris, that is actually inspired to go get off their seat and go and explore the world through the lens of football, what advice would you have for them? Well, first of all, again, I pre appreciate your kind words. I'm, I'm not sure if it's deserved. Um, but, but look, I mean, I would say this, um, you know, basically at the beginning of my journey, it never seemed realistic to anyone, you know, again, 
in Scotland at that time, if you're not an ex-player or you've never even been to a top academy, you don't have any connections, you're not going to be a, a football coach at a first team level or, you know, you're certainly not going to be a sporting director or um, uh, any, anything of that nature. And to be honest, at that point, I, was, I would have been more than satisfied to be, as I mentioned, earning a full-time salary, coaching, you know, another 15s team or w- whatever the case may be. Um, but that was, that was a mentality. And that was a mentality from, from my parents as well. You know, let me tell you, um, they saw it as a pipe dream, you know, a hobby, which, uh, you know, um, my mum certainly was, uh, was, was constantly telling me to get a real job, you know, because at the beginning there was a lot of volunteering and a lot of um, low paid work, which, which the results are not immediate. You know, in my mind, I always knew this is what's required to get to the top level. I have to do all of this work. I don't care if I get paid for it. I don't care if I have to fly around the world to learn new ideas. I don't care if I have to drive four hours to go and to go and see a training session. Or, I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not going to put any sob stories in. But there but there are so many there's so many aspects in the journey and my journey where <laughs> the sacrifices were immense. You know, on a a financial level, on a on a professional level, and and on a personal level for sure. You know, going to any country where you can get the best opportunity means. You know, let me put it like this: if you've got a girlfriend and she doesn't want to go to to the country, she doesn't want to move to China, then you know, if you've been together five years, you know, it's probably not going to last. So um, th- those things are not easy. You know, and and sometimes people can look from the outside as if you're a robot that you just um, you pursue your dreams like a machine, but. But it's not like that, you know, it's difficult. And you just have to have that blind faith that we spoke about earlier. Don't um, pay attention to what anybody else thinks. The truth is, if you put in the work and you're super prepared, that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing you have to do is network. And I don't think there's enough attention paid to that. Certainly, Connor, um, I mean, you're, you're doing this podcast, which I admire very much. I've got absolutely no doubt that... Um, um, either at the beginning when you started it or indirectly since you've started. Um, one of the big benefits of it has been you've probably connected with a lot of interesting people and expanded your network. And networking is absolutely key. And I think then that's when preparation can meet opportunity. You know, when, as we said, when you're in more places at more times, yeah, you might be in the right place at the right time. Somebody that knows you might be looking for someone like you. They might give you a call. And then you have to know what you're talking about. And if, and And it might take 10 years, it might take five years for that opportunity to come up that you're looking for. And and it might mean you have to do a lot of things that you don't want to do in the meantime. I have to be honest, if you're not prepared to do the things you don't want to do in the meantime, work voluntarily, um, do maybe the role you don't want to do and get on with it and don't complain, you're probably not going to make it in this game unless you have a network and and a football background from the beginning. So, So you have to be prepared for that sacrifice. But I would say that it's completely worth it. You know, don't give up. All, like I said at the beginning of this call, a lot of people were way ahead of me uh, when I was in my early 20s and they gave up pursuing their dream and settled for a, a job doing this or that to earn whatever money they could get at the time, you know, because, because it seemed like an impossible dream. Don't give up, you know, o- o- on the impossible dream. And the other thing I would say is um, a lot of people when I, when I was young, um, trying to connect, trying to see sessions, trying to get ideas, um, a lot of experienced coaches especially in the Scottish culture. And I don't mind to criticise it because, um, you know, it, it, it was very disappointing, you know, for me as a young coach to experience it. But people, people don't want to help you, you know, in those type of countries uh, until perhaps you get to a point where um, maybe, maybe they think that you can help them, you know, and then, of course, they, everything is friendly. So you will also come across a lot of people who are not interested to spend their time with you. You know, I'm very conscious that, I do try to respond to, to young people who are maybe in the same position I was in in the past, especially if I see that they're determined and maybe I don't have the opportunities. Um, it doesn't mean I can, I can help them all, but, um, but certainly for those young people, try and find um, people who are ahead of you, either in terms of career, experience or knowledge and, and soak, soak that up from them. You know? they, they could be mentors which, which could help you, you know, in a professional way or they could just help you in terms of opening your mind to new horizons and I think you know if you look back at the the kind of the renaissance era you know in Florence to make a comparison uh, I know this is not a very um, Glasgow uh, typical conversation but but if we were to compare that you know what made them uh, so good at, at, at you know at producing art at producing architecture sculpting science it was it was the apprenticeship structure you know 
uh, a young, a young uh, Michelangelo would go at 12 or 13 years old and spend all his life working with the top artists of the day. And then, you know, by the time they, they were 18, 19, so find people who are ahead of you, who are open to, to share with you, um, go and learn from them uh, and find as many people like that as you can. And I think that will accelerate your development. And then when you combine the knowledge, you combine the network, you, you combine the patience and the sacrifice, eventually one door will open. It might not be the door you want, but that will help you get to the next door. It may also not be the door you want, but eventually, eventually it will come. And uh, like I say, there's many times along the road I thought about giving up and doing something else, you know, where I, again, I could probably have earned more money in the short term when I was 24, 25. Uh, for the same amount of hours of, of, of crazy hours of work. But looking back now, I absolutely do not regret it. And uh, and I don't think that anybody else would either. Diego Martinez, the ex-Granada coach, had an absolutely fascinating quote on the above preparation meets opportunity. He said last year about building, we build a bridge by walking upon it. And I think that's indicative of the journey you've been on today, Chris. It's been absolutely fascinating to spend the last hour and a half in your company, an hour in the podcast, half an hour before off camera. But um, thanks so much for coming on. Hope you got as much value from this pod as we did listening to it and hope to have you on again soon. No, Connor, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me on and, and I hope there was something interesting in there.